Okay, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. So the target for today is to cover in 70 days how to give da'wah without having a doctor, without having a doctorate, without being so, you know, we may think that I need to have knowledge of the level of Dr. Zakir Naik to invite people to Islam, or you know, uh, Abdul Rahim Ghani, Yusuf Estes, uh, who else do we have? Uh, you, um, Hamza Zorsis, right? All these top people who, have, who we have seen debating with the top figures. But for the majority of the people, for the masses, you know, like closer. Yeah. So for the masses, you don't need to have a doctorate to give da'wah. There's a lot of people, inshallah, if you follow the material that we'll be going over today, and you just present that to people, you will be able to, inshallah, give the light of Islam, the nur of Islam, and save a lot of souls. Okay? And also to make it easy, what I will do is all these slides will be available as well on the internet. And we will put a link in the video description as well as you will see a link uh, shortly on the slides as well. So you can just go there, you know, grab the slide deck, put it on your phone and uh, practice. Just practice a bit in front of a mirror, practice among yourself and just start doing, giving da'wah. And then when you have any issues or you run into major things, it's not a game of ego. You say, you know what? That's a good question. I appreciate it. But this is what I have. And then, you know, I can take you to someone who can potentially answer your questions. Right? So you're giving them this route. Say, hey, this is the route that I believe in. And here's why I believe in. This route will lead you to, uh, to happiness, to success. And then if they say, oh, what, what about this route? What about that route? So you can try to explain it to them. And we'll address a lot of these things on the slide. So you'll have all those slides on your phone or your computer. But... If you get stuck, that's okay. You can bring them in and inshallah we can talk to them. So what as I'm saying is that if you just give them the basics, that's, that's going to do a lot of work for you. And we'll do a basic thing. We'll just take a Quranic approach to it. We'll uh, cover a story from Quran and that addresses pretty much most of the question. That will give you a framework to build upon. Okay. So uh, yeah, so is the slides coming from the media room or do you want to connect to my computer? Yeah, yeah, well, no, I guess. Okay. Tayyab. So the title is You Don't Need a Doctorate to Save Souls, right? Another connotation is You don't need to have a PhD in da'wah and extensive st studies and debates and all that to be able to call people to Islam. Okay, so the beginning, I have a few introductory slides. It's good for you to kind of create your own introduction. So when you're speaking to a non Muslim, uh, introduce yourself, who you are, how you contribute in the society and what are your hobbies so they can relate to you at a personal level and understand them as well so that you can give them relevant examples okay the next slide is basically a link uh, that you can follow and grab the whole slide deck keep it on your phone have it accessible and be ready to give uh, da'wah be ready to sh tell, share what islam is and answer important questions that a lot of people around us have okay so here's an outline of what we'll be covering today you guys can't see it People on the screen will be able to see it, inshallah. Okay, now this is a very important slide. Uh, Yahya, what's the situation with the slides? Okay, I really want to show you this thing. I don't have a, a, that long of an HDMI cable. Oh, you can, oh yeah, so do you have something there? Yeah. No, it can. Okay, this is something we should put in the masjid to-do list. Oh, we don't have any wire unless we're gonna go wireless. Uh, well, there is a wire somewhere. Um, okay. 
So yeah, we're going to come back to this, okay? This is, a, this is a point I'll come back to. Remind me when we get the slides up. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ الصَّالِحَا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ So if we are seeking the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the greatest things we can do is actually call people to Islam, right? And as, as you start loving someone, when you reach a level that you can talk about that person, about that one, your love grows. So that's the really next level of love when you can actually advocate for that cause, when you can actually call other people towards it, okay? Now, so there's many other examples of da'wah, but if you think about it, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, it's very important to think about your world view, right? How do you view this world? What is your passion? What is it that keeps you ticking? What is your personal law? What needs to happen for you to be happy? Okay, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a lot of different examples of the, the dunya in Quran, right? How it is like, you know, uh, earth becoming flourishing with greenery and so on and so forth, and then losing that all. Right? Or, right? It's just being this mata, the temporary enjoyment and a lot of deceiveness. Now, another way of thinking about it is, for example, think about if you were at an airport, right? You're in an airport, you're on transit, and you have a lot of things. You have different shops, you can do business on airport, if you will, right? So you're, st if you're spending your time on airport, and you have this air miles card that, you know, depending on what you purchase and how you use your time, you can earn your points. And at some point, the call will be made that you have to take your flight. And depending on how much points you have earned, you'll either be flying business class or economy, right? And that will also determine where you are going. So you can end up going to a fantastic, beautiful resort, or you can end up going to a war zone country. So this is an example, if you will, of us living in this world and then dying and either going to paradise or hellfire. So as you realize this thing, part of that is to how can I, you know, confidently practice Islam? What is it that kind of challenges me living and practicing Islam? Not only among the Muslims, but also when I'm out there, when I'm out among the non-Muslims, how can I be confident? So there are certain things that you can do to increase your confidence. And there's a great video um, on Talk Islam, which you'll see the link for. I highly recommend watching it and especially showing it to the youth as well. So how can you be confident? So there are certain things that you can do to be confident about your practice of Islam, about your adhering to the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So part of that is for you to understand who Allah is and be able to explain it to others. That will make you not be shy about your religion or why do you have to pray and on all that sort of stuff and you'll be able to uh, relate it to people and be confident about your practice. Why I do it? Because I love Allah and this is what Allah loves. You know, simply. A lot of people, if you think about your colleagues, you know, they might have a different look or, you know, why are you growing your beard? You know, and then you might say, oh, my, my life, my wife loves the new style or my girlfriend loves the new style, whatever. So they're so confident about talking about people and changing because they want to please either a particular person or their close friends. All right. So they say a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So we'll try that. So you have to be confident to explain to people, does God exist? Is Islam logical, right? Is our belief logical? And how do we know that this is from God? So I think if we are confident about those things, inshallah it will help us to confidently express Islam in front of non-Muslims as well. Another way to be confident about Islam is to be expert in your field. It's to be an expert in your field where people actually value what you are contributing. And this is something we talked about in today's khutbah. By the way, if you haven't heard that today's khutbah was about how to facilitate adoption of Islam for someone who is getting interested in Islam. And we talked about different roles in the society. In the end, we talked about your role as an expert, your role as an influencer, your role as a powerful person. And now what we are talking about is how to invite someone who doesn't know about Islam to Islam. Okay? So if you're an expert and you express your Islam, that is also very valuable. Right? We see from you know, great people like Muhammad Ali, right? how much impact he had for not being shy about his religion when he had that status in the society. Another way is for you to have Righteous company. Yeah.
Okay, so it has detected here. So I guess you just have to select the right input channel. And, right, so having a righteous company is very important. So if you have colleagues at work or in school or around you, those who are practicing Islam, it will become easier for you to practice Islam. So it's important to take a look at these four things, right? Being confident about it, being able to explain it, uh, being an expert, providing value in the society, in your community, in your work environment, and then finally having a righteous company. And obviously the rewards are great, right? So I'm sure that, you know, especially this audience, you don't have to repeat the rewards of guiding someone to Islam. So you being able to present Islam, first of all, helps you because you're more confident about Islam. And secondly, if you are able to call someone to Islam, you have rewards just for calling, just for trying. And on top of it, if Allah blesses you that the person accepts Islam, then obviously you have that ongoing charity as well. So again, we have a picture on the screen. Uh, about you know so you might see someone like that and you're like there's no way this person is going to accept Islam right but the the reality is he did right somebody gave him Quran somebody had a conversation with him and now he's actually become a die so before we go there obviously quickly speaking you know you have to also worry about your own self because shaitan is worried about you so you being a caller have to have certain characteristics such as kindness, gentleness, not being harsh, you know, having empathy, having the concern for the people, and not making a, a debate about your own ego. It's not about your own ego and how much can you defeat the other person. Because sometimes if you're defeating the other person, you're actually pushing him away from Islam. So that doesn't help, right? So your goal is actually to make the person see it clearly that why Islam is the truth. Now, at the same time, knowing that like anything else in life, you cannot do it unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assists you. So there are ways to get the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from those ways are to increase and raise your status as a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which, as we know, is for you to take care of your obligatory deeds and then going further with your voluntary deeds. So as you keep doing that, you raise your status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah's aid and support increases for you. So the da'wah should not be a means of, to distract you from your obligations, right? From your obligations between you and Allah, from your obligations between you and the family, and so on and so forth. Oh, yeah. Okay, now finally we have three points. Those are specific risks to a da'i. So you have to be aware of that as you get into this, right? Making sure that you are still doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. So even if people are not appreciating it, you continue. You're not doing it for personal fame, personal wealth, and so on and so forth. And secondly, being desensitized. So sometimes, spending a lot of time with non-Muslims, or new Muslims, you might talk a lot about sins commonly, right? So this is thing that, you know, you wouldn't talk about it if you're only hanging out with Muslims most of the time. But if you're hanging out a lot with non-Muslims and new Muslims, you might start talking about sins that are transgressions against the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you do not maintain that by, you know, having the righteous company, you may go down the negative road as well. Finally, you know, you don't want to be confusing yourself, right? So, you know, imagine if you're a boxer and you fight someone who is way above your league, you can hurt yourself. So likewise, as I said, there's a lot of people who are not going to be opposing Islam, who are not going to be crazy about, you know, fighting against Islam. And you don't have to deal with those type of people. You deal with the people that, are, that you are comfortable with, and then you move on from one person to the other. So nothing, Rahil? Uh, yeah, as long as you can move the slides, I can see the slides on the phone. Now before it said that it detected it, now it's not uh, detecting it, so the input. Uh, if you continue on that, uh, also important thing is what is your metric of success, right? Is your metric of success number of shahadas, 
Is it your metric of success? How many people talk to you? Is it metric of success that have I put in, you know, enough effort? If I put in my best effort, and I'm, am I being consistent with my efforts? So that is also very important to uh, think about. Now, the first point that I want to drive home is a lot of time. There's two types, two ways that you can start a conversation. So somebody might come up to you and say, "Hey, what's up with you guys? You know that." You ha like why, why does your wife have to wear hijab, right? Why are you oppressing her? Or may I ask you another you know, question about Islam? You know, how come you know, Muslims killed non-Muslims? How come Quran say this and that? You know, things like that. So they come and they ask you a question, right? Now, what can happen and what happens a lot is, some, is we have this urge to start answering that question, okay? When we do that, something interesting happens and we don't realize it. And I've experimented it and I've told them this thing, and then I let them practice, and people still do the same thing. So it's very interesting, because we have this urge of, yeah, I know the answer, I'm gonna tell you the answer, but what happens when you're doing that? Who is controlling the conversation? Who asks the question in the first place? The person, right? So he, he has the upper hand, he's driving the conversation. So one thing you always wanna be thinking about when you are spending time in da'wah, is that I want to have the steering wheel. I want to be in charge, I want to be in control of the conversation. So always take it back. Even during the dialogue conversation, something political might come up. So you may have to remind the person that, look, hey, let's talk about the creator. You know, we can keep talking about the creation and the politics and how people deal with the politics all day long. But right now, let's spend this half an hour or an hour talking about the creator. So you always want to get that steering wheel back. So you are the one who is driving the conversation. Because what may happen is that you will say, oh, this is a benefit, this is why we don't eat pork, the research says this, and then he will come up with something else, and we'll, you'll just keep continuing, and then after half an hour, he might throw another ball at you. But what about this? So how long will you continue, right? And you've spent an hour of your life, and the person still doesn't know the message of Islam, the person still doesn't know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes, depending on how uncomfortable you get, you might start lying and you know, adding things, oh, the research says this, while well, you don't have any evidence for that. So that's the number one. Well, what's the first principle that we talked about? Guys, please. Take the steering wheel back. You should be the one driving the car. Clear? Always think who is driving the conversation, right? I want the steering wheel back. Another way of thinking about it is the notion of, imagine if I'm, if I'm wearing green shades, I see everything green, you're wearing red shades, and you see everything red, right? And I can spend the whole day saying this, this, and that, but unless we both lose our glasses and we all see from each other's perspective, we will not understand. So the reason we don't eat pork is, why don't we eat pork? Huh? It's haram, what does that mean? To tell it to a non-Muslim, what does haram mean? No, that's not what haram means. There you go, right? I love Allah. Right? Allah has given me a choice. My creator has given me a choice. He has said, look, if you can, I have the ability to eat it, but if I choose not to, I get closer to Allah. I earn the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why I don't. So the argument then becomes from this angle, if you can establish or show the person that, look, I believe that there exists Allah who has communicated to us and his, his communication in his sharia, he has explained to us why to do certain things and why not to do certain things. And if I follow that, I will be successful. So if you give them this framework, it kind of answers all the questions. And then you'll have you know, some hesitations that you can deal with. So that's the principle, right? So one way, for example, Ayra calls it, go rap. So you want to think about it in these terms. Uh, G for God. So first, clearly convey the concept that there exists a creator. There exists someone that we depend upon. Okay? Then the second thing is, if a God exists, that cannot be multiple gods. You cannot have your own God, I cannot have my own God. That would not make sense. There's only one true God. And then third step is if that God exists, if there's a one God, it makes sense, it is very likely, it is very logical, and it makes sense in my heart that that God has communicated to me what I should be doing and what I should not be doing to be successful. And that's the revelation part. And then the next step is, why do I believe that Quran is a revelation, is a book, is a statement, is a speech of God? And then also you can add, obviously these things are related, 
But if you want to establish furthermore, you can say why I believe. And here are some evidences for Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be a messenger of God. So that's the framework that we want to use if you want to break it down, okay? Now, in terms of, so what you should be doing is that when somebody comes in and asks you a question, you thank them. Hey, I thank you for having this concern to learn about religion and about my religion. You could be doing everything else. So you elevate them, you thank them, you introduce yourself. My name is Zubair. My name is so-and-so. What's yours? I appreciate you taking the time to learn about my religion. For you to be able to understand why, why this is part of Islam, I need you to first tell you what Islam is. Do you have a few minutes for me to explain to you what Islam is? Clear? Okay, the second thing is, now again, we just have to do it in 17 minutes so we don't have time to practice. The second thing, uh, what you can do is also to make it interesting, is you can throw a curveball at them and say, you know what, somebody can still be a Muslim, even if they drink or even if they eat pork. They can still be a Muslim. So let's understand what Islam is. Let me tell you what it is. You have a few minutes, let me tell you. So you kind of take their attention away from the question and then you tell them what Islam is. Now, some interesting thing can happen. The person may say, oh, Quran says you call non-Muslims. Yes and no. No. And then you try to explain, no, yes and no. So you, you, can, you can basically return that punch by saying, look, every question cannot be answered by a yes and no. So now we have expert. Let's see what happens. Okay, every question cannot be answered by a yes and no. What's your name? Yes and no. Right? So you kind of prove your point that every question cannot be answered with a yes and no. Or if somebody say, oh, have you stopped beating your wife? Yes and no. Right? You cannot. Okay. So if you just click on mirror displays. Fire. So another angle to that is somebody can say something ridiculous. Like, does Islam tell you to kill baby? So obviously you want to you know, destroy that as that has nothing to do with Islam, right? Of course not. And then, but thank you for asking about Islam. Let me tell you what Islam actually is about. So, so that's that. So is that clear? Now, secondly, that's a passive initiation. Somebody asked you something and you built upon that. Another way is you actively engaging and you actively initiating a conversation. And that is, you know, if somebody talks about something and you relate it to the purpose of life, you know, you saying God willing, you saying inshallah, you know, you're taking time off for Eid, and then you can tie that, hey, you know, I would probably like to sit down with you sometime, and let's have coffee together, and let me tell you about Islam. Or we are having this event at the mosque, would you like to come by? Right, so you are having, you're trying something to, uh, to engage with people. Now, one thing to remember here, and that every salesperson should know, even if you're not a salesperson, you know this, because when you're having dinner, you get calls from telemarketer, right? And what do you do? You say no, you might be nice, you might hang up, or you might buy, right? So that person has to make 10, 20, 100 calls for him to get one? Yes. So don't be afraid of getting the no's. Rejection is something that you are rewarded for. So think about it, like every time you get rejected, as if somebody's paying you $10 or $100. So don't, be, don't hesitate to have this active conversation with someone. Now, here, here's a few tips, right? So whenever you're interacting with someone in the society, uh, on a social level, either you are above them because they have a need that you can fulfill, right? Such as a telemarketer calling you, right? Uh, you taking an Uber ride, you know. Anytime you are a customer, in general, you have a little bit, you know, above social level. You have an advantage, you have an edge. As they say, customer is always right. So practice in those situations. Practice in those situations. And uh, then you take it to a next level. He's a little head. So most of has to be here. So now we're in sync. Nice. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So, so you have to be at a level. The next thing you can do is basically speak to someone who is at your level, your <laughs> colleague, your friend, right? So first you started with someone that you have advantage over. The next thing you take it to is someone at your level. Okay, and then you can take it to the next level and you go with someone who has advantage over you, right? A societal advantage over you. And that can happen once you realize 
that even though per that person may have a higher status in the society, at the end of the day, you have a higher status in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has, He has blessed you with faith. Right? You need to have that sort of confidence. So when you start the discussion, obviously you want to set some you know, ground rules that, hey, we're going to be using common sense because you cannot say, oh, because Quran said so and so, right? That wouldn't work in that conversation. So you're saying that certain things are common sense, right? So for example, you know, no one would make an argument about crossing the street blindfolded, right? That's against common sense. You don't cross street blindfolded. So what we are trying to do with all this, what we're trying to do with all this is actually awakening the fitrah, right? As we know that the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that everyone is born on this natural state of fitrah where they can recognize Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, okay? And we'll talk a bit about this at the end as well, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I'll go back to the earlier slide that I skipped. Okay, this is what I want to show. So, mind, intellect, as you can see here, is one way of learning the truth. It's not the only way. Because someone can come with an interesting argument and prove to you that one equals two. Like you are seeing a mathematical proof on the screen that actually mathematically establishes to, uh, to a common person that one equals two. Okay? But I'm deceiving in these equations. But it's not, it's not trivial to see the deception. It's not trivial to see the deception. Now, this has a few, few important things. One is that somebody might come and he may be too much philosophical and using all this jargon. You don't necessarily have to deal with that person because that person might be able to you know, manipulate things and show one equals two to you. Then you would have to come and understand the underlying philosophy to be able to refute that person. So that's one thing. Second thing is you have to understand that the way you know that Islam is a true is much higher. It has much more soundness. And that is your fitrah, your heart telling you that this makes sense. And Islam is the truth. So that's the reason I wanted to show you these two slides. So now let's continue. The point was that we're not arguing, we're not using all this logic for the sake of logic. We are using it to wipe out the dust, to, to clear, to clean the rust and to awaken the natural state of the heart and to awaken the fitrah. Okay, so what have we talked about so far? You know, be, well, first of all, we talked about the da'wah, why da'wah, you know, characteristics and challenges to a da'i. And we talked about being in charge, being in control of the conversation, how to change the conversation from a debate or a challenging question to an opportunity to present Islam, to an opportunity to present Tawheed, right? And then the, the framework of go rap, and then we've talked about what we're trying to do, our aim is to kind of wipe out the dust, to clean the rust, and to awaken the fitrah. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do, you know, bring the heart outside. Tell you. So here's what I'd like to do. So now, having said that, I have set it up. Now I have the opportunity. You are listening. Now I'm telling you what Islam is. Okay? So I really think this is super beneficial. So you say, okay, look, I'm going to tell you what I believe about Islam. Okay? So now you're giving them a whole story. There's another way where you can actually kind of say, okay, look, I think God exists, and here are my reasons for God's existence. I think that God is one, and here are the reasons for God's oneness. And I think... Uh, that you know, God revealed us a book, and here are the reasons, and here is why I believe Quran is the book of God, and here is why I believe that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the Prophet of Allah. And that will come. Okay, we'll do a slide on this, and we'll just wrap it up quickly. Again, what we're trying to do is give you this base framework for you to be able to ha start having conversations. For those of you who are interested, you know, we do want to form a you know a Dawah team and a new Muslim care or Reaver success team. So if you're interested, please reach out to us, and then we'll do more more things, inshallah. So what I do is I say, okay, look, let me tell you how it all began, right? And then you're going to use these verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, and you're going to start your discussion with that. So you can say, and, you know, recite the words to them as well. And then you will start the look. At one point, Allah had two types of creation. Allah had angels. That's a creation that's made out of light. You have some concept of angel, right? And most people would have that. And these creation, that, the, the angels, they don't disobey Allah. They don't have a choice. Whatever Allah tells them, they do it. Okay? 
Then they also had a creation, which is Satan. You guys know that Satan. And that is essentially created from, fi uh, from uh, fire, right? And that, he has a free will, right? So he can choose to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he chooses to. Okay, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them, uh, look, I'm going to create human beings, right? When Allah tells this to the angels, they become concerned, right? Because they know that, uh, that the human being will have a free will. He will have a choice to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they, they realize this and they look at the extreme negative side and then this ask that how would you create someone they, that would basically cause corruption and bloodshed on earth. Okay, so that kind of answers your question in a sense that look, you know, the notion of evil is one part, right? And that's something that the angels were concerned about too. But that's part and parcel of giving free will to human being. So now human being is in, in a very interesting place because of this free will. So imagine, like is, is there any, you know, direct praise for angels? Right? Can Allah boast about angels, right? You know how we know that the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions us and boasts about us on the day of Arafah when we are fasting, end of Ramadan and so on and so forth, right? That cannot be applied to angels because they don't have a choice. So it's quite interesting that Allah creates someone and gives them the knowledge that what is pleasing to Allah and what is displeasing to Allah gives them the ability that they can do, you know, they can choose either ways. And then if they make the right choice, they're appreciated and they're rewarded. And if they make the wrong choice, they are eligible for punishment. So that is quite beautiful. Now, so you, you tell them this thing that look, they have this dialogue and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the, tells the angels that look, I know what you don't know. And the angels realize this. Okay? Now to give this strength, to, give, to prove this claim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also establishes clearly by giving knowledge to Adam alayhi salam, the first human being, our father, and he gives them the knowledge that angels don't have. And then he clearly demonstrates to the angels that can you tell me about these things? And they agree that we don't have that knowledge, we only know what you have told us. And then Adam alayhi salam tells them all the story and establishes the superiority of Adam by knowledge. And Allah tells them, look, there's a lot that you don't know. You're only thinking about one thing, which is that extreme. But it's quite powerful to have a human being from this human being will be people that would be beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Will be the people that would be ready to sacrifice their son for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Will be the people that would be calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Will be the people that would be waking up in the middle of night to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Will be the people that would be ready to give up their wealth and their lives for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And this is why they are praised. Now moreover, if you think about it, think of a God, right? If you, if you just want to take it, think of a God that only has a creation that has no free will. Right? That God in and itself is limited because He's not showing His attribute of control. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us free will, but He's still in charge. Okay, let me explain what I mean by that. So, my phone... Technically, a lot of people have the ability to steal this phone, right? Right? But at the same time, this phone cannot be stolen and nothing can happen to this phone unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows it. So if all of you plot against stealing the phone and Allah does not want that to happen, it wouldn't happen, right? And we just saw an example for that, right? So I can work on the slides, I can have the slides ready, you know, be all there. And you know, message everybody, okay, I want the slides, you know, the TV to be here, 7.30, I can do whatever, but unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want, it cannot happen. And that is quite beautiful, which you cannot see if there was no concept of free will. And then at the same time, how do you see the forgiving side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then how do you see the retribution side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His ability to punish as well as forgive? So this really gives you a complete and perfect picture of God. So make sure you're explaining these points to the non-believer, to someone who does not know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then, so I'm summar I have summarized this here. Look, choice, Allah knows everything. It has the wisdom behind it. And our knowledge is limited. And then there's a notion of trust and submission. So basically, once you've established the superiority of Adam, then you walk them through the test. Now what happens is the angel and the Satan are commanded to prostrate to Adam as an obedience, as an act of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Okay? Angels do that. They did not ask, they did not refute. But Shaitan, his ego kicks in and he starts putting in logic. And whose logic? His own logic, which is so limited, he comes with one angle. Why should I do that? I'm better than him because of the, uh, the element of creation. Right? And he doesn't have that submission because he thinks that, you know, that's the only reason. And that's that notion of, look, this is why we don't eat pork. Because, not because we have done our research and it's harmful for your health and this and that, but because we are submitting to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's it. You, you, you define this test. Let the order of Allah comes in, somebody does it, someone doesn't do it, and he justifies it. So this establishes that arrogance. Right? So he's being arrogant about it. Then the test of Adam alayhi salam comes in. Our father. Okay, and then you're telling them this thing that look, Adam al Islam now is put into paradise where he doesn't have to work. There's no evil in paradise. There's no sickness in paradise. There are no taxes in paradise. There's no war in paradise, right? Any evil that you can think of doesn't happen in paradise. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, look, go eat and enjoy yourself, but this one tree, leave it alone. Okay, and why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give a reason that we know of that it has cholesterol, or it's fatty, or you're gonna die, or anything like that. Just khalas, leave it alone. So that's where the submission comes in. And Adam al is fine and happy, he's not going there. You know, there's a wife for Adam alayhi salam, or a mother. And then what happens next? Move it down. So what happens next is, shaitan comes in and he persists in lying to Adam right? He says, no, if you go for this tree, you will have a life forever. And you will have a kingdom that will never perish. So now he's putting in a desire with false promise. And he's being consistent about it. And finally, Adam falls for it. So now, this is also a good point that you can establish the fact that, look, you have angels that will support you in, wor in worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You also have your own good side that will be encouraged to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you also have the satanic side, okay, that discourages you and that makes you these false promises. That, oh, I'm so busy, I cannot practice Islam, you know, so on and so forth. It's just deceiving us. But what happens after this test is how Adam alayhi salam reacts. And how he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives him. And that time, you also want to show him that, look, now this is another beautiful sign, right? It shows another amazing attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he can forgive you. If he sees you are sincere, he can forgive you. He does not need to kill someone to forgive you. Right? So think about it. Which makes more sense? A God that, doesn't, that does need to kill someone of his own to forgive you or God that can just forgive you because He can. Right? So you want to discuss that with them and you also want to establish the fact that look, somebody could have you know, a level of relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's here at a certain level. He commits a sin, the level drops and then he's so sincere in repentance and good deeds that he may now go up a level above, I mean above where he was before, before he committed the sin. Right? So that's such a beautiful relationship. Then, you want to bring this to the ending and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now put us all on earth. And he made this challenge that look, whoever follows my verses, whoever follows what I want you guys to establish will end up in paradise, will have no fear, no grief. And if you choose other way, then you have punishment. So once you have explained that, that is a very beautiful story that works out a lot for a lot of people. And so far, I haven't used the logic. Okay, so that's why I showed you this thing earlier. And I'm not saying anything logic, I'm just saying this is what makes sense, right? And there's nothing logical, there's nothing illogical about what I said. Is there anything illogical about what I said? It all adds up, right? It gives them the perfect picture. It answers their question of why there is some, you know, evil if we look at the short-sighted picture. Everything that happens has a long-term good, but there's some short-sighted pain and short-sighted evil. So it answers that. It gives them why are we here. It gives them a purpose of why they should live. It gives them a hope for a better future. So it's a very aligned and logical presentation of the truth. Then the next thing you want to talk about is who is Allah. 
right? And a lot of people would be, so, they don't know, but and people are looking for this, right? Once they realize who Allah is and the type of relationship they can have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it just becomes amazing. So you want to make sure that you tell them who Allah is, right? And then obviously you said, look, this is the Arabic word. Even in the Bible, they use the same word for God, okay? And our belief, our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that we believe that Allah is the only one worthy of my full trust, my full submission, and my full love. And that's the state that Muslims are in. And that is a beautiful state that a lot of people would want to have. Then you want to tell them that Allah is the Lord. The Arabic word for that is the Rabb, which includes three things. That number one, Allah is the creator of everything that exists. The ideas, the thoughts, the inventions, the objects. Allah is the one who is the creator. You may have a human creator as an intermediary because Allah facilitated that research to happen, that ideas to evolve and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, Allah is the creator. Allah is the one who created me in a time where I can experience, you know, having a video call with a family member who is like, you know, continents away. That's from the facilitation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how he evolved the ideas and the research. Now, at the same time, from a worldly perspective, I can go to a showroom or I can go to a store and buy a phone and there's an exchange of currency and an object or a commodity and I can own the commodity. But when it comes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the absolute owner of everything, including objects, including my body, including my relationships, including my you know, eye, my hearing ability and so on and so forth. So it's a favor of Allah that I enjoy these things and when Allah takes it away, I'm still left, it, left with a lot of favors. And then Allah is the planner, the sustainer, the nourisher. Allah is the one who can protect whatever I have. He's the one who can take it from me. He's the one who can increase it. He's the one who can decrease it. So once you have a relationship like that with someone, you have a totally different mindset. And people will love to have that mindset and to live with that tranquility in their life. He's the most merciful. Now this is very important. Now you and I may think, oh, how come that person is not going to paradise? But if anybody deserved to be in paradise, Allah will make sure that person is in paradise. He's much more merciful to anyone and everyone than you and I can be, than their own parents can be. So it's a, fa it's a false logic to think about that you no know, certain person should be in paradise and he or she will not be. Because if they deserved it, they will be there. Okay, and then this is something we'll talk about in salvation, that at a certain point, you know, for example, the masjid school, right? So think about the weekend school that we have here, right? Or any other university, what have you. So they have some basic criteria. If they were to admit people that do not meet that criteria, it will be disastrous for the people who are going into that school, clear? So if somebody does not deserve, does not have the quality, does not have the heart to be in paradise, then he or she will not be there. Okay, but if they have the possibility, if they deserve it, Allah's mercy will not prevent that from happening. Then the point about ever living, you know, somebody who does not depend on anything. And uh, the point of intercession, and that how Allah knows everything, the past, the present, the future, nothing escapes the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all these things are unique and exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one has these qualities at that perfect level, at that complete level as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, then you also want to talk about the concept of the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that there are two types of wills of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, one is something that will happen no matter what you do. Example, simple example, what happened with the slides. Okay, another example is somebody getting sick. You know, someone's day of birth, date of birth, death, you know, day of death. You know, things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written will happen as is. Okay, there are causes to it, but you cannot do anything about it in general. And then there are other type of will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's the legal will. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want us to cheat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to establish five prayers. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to wake up at a certain time and, you know, pray our prayer of, uh, in the morning. But we have the ability to not do it. We have the ability to transgress and that's the legal will, right? Which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fully capable of. But at many times Allah gives you the flexibility to do what you like. And that's what creates the opportunity for you to raise in your status or drop in your status in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the notion of justice. 
right? If you don't have the notion of justice, if you don't have a notion of hereafter, there's a lot of incompleteness, there's a lot of lack, right? How, how will you have the justice if Allah will not establish justice, right? Because at some point you have a poor child dying in a third world country and you have us enjoying all the luxury. How does that all add up? Where is justice? But when you have the picture of Akhirah and that this life is nothing compared in length compared to the Akhirah, you can answer these questions. You can answer how things can be justified and balanced. And then finally, that Allah is all wise. Anything that happens in the Sharia of Allah, if Allah dictates something, orders something in the Sharia, has a wisdom behind it. Sometimes we may know partial wisdom, sometimes we may not know anything. Sometimes we may know a lot more. Sometimes we come to know because of the scientific research that happens and they say, oh, you know, even a small amounts of alcohol is bad for you. Right? But the point is, everything that happened has a wisdom behind it. Even uh, the worldly affairs, so somebody losing a job, somebody losing a car, car breaking down, a divorce happening, child loss, all these things have a wisdom behind it. And once you live a life, when you have that sort of understanding about your creator, it's so beautiful and there are tons and tons of people out there that are hungry for this. You just have to reach out to them. So now my challenge is, then when I explain this to them, I said, look, now think about this. You go to any religion or even you go to drawing board yourself and you draw or describe a more complete, a better picture than what we know from Islam. You cannot come up with a better, monotheistic, complete, perfect understanding of the Creator than what we have in Islam. And that itself is a very solid point of the truth of Islam. Clear? Challenge is open. Then you can talk about the point of revelation. Right? That, you know, from, from your example, like, would it make sense, wouldn't it be an incomplete God? If he exists, but he does not tell me what to do. He does not tell me the way to get to paradise. He just leaves me alone. I have no way to distinguish the good from the bad. Right? That would be an incomplete God for me to exist and then put me into paradise or hellfire randomly. Right? So that doesn't make sense. So it makes, and, and we don't see that in the human world, right? Any company you work for, any city, any town has a constitution, has a law, you know, has best practices, business conduct guidelines, whatever you call them, that distinguishes an A player from a, someone who's gonna be fired or laid off, right? So you have that. So now, how do we know that Quran is from God? Now you can now show different evidences. The, the most important evidence is that Quran comes with the understanding of life, understanding of God, that is super comprehensive, that is super perfect, and there's nothing like it. Okay? Then it's consistent. There's no contradiction in Quran, and it's miraculous nature, even if you pursue, you know, you can read papers on linguistic nature of Quran, so on and so forth. You can look at the historical, different, you have tons and tons of different analysis that you can get into, but as I was saying earlier, for most people, you don't need to get into that. Right? So you can just give them this basic thing and it like lights, lightens them up. Why? I'll show you why in a second. But if you want to, then you can dig deeper. I'm going to give you some resources at the end and you can have those points at, on your phone as well. But that is normally, usually not needed. So then you want to talk about the look, if you worship God, if you worship Allah, you have a lot of fruits for your own stuff. Your quality of life will change and it should. Right? How can there be a true creator and the quality of life be same for someone who recognizes a creator and someone who does not. So there are many different, first of all, what is worship? To know Allah, to love Allah, to love what Allah loves, leading to obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to make Him a center of your attention, a center of your, 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 your efforts. Instead of chasing for the pleasure of this person, that person having all these contradictions, you're now focusing on the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you give them various examples of acts, various spiritual examples, ritual examples, societal examples of worship. So from the fruits of worship is that contentment that you feel in your heart. Okay? Then in your hereafter, you're retiring in paradise and being protected from hellfire. It has a lot of things to do with your emotional situation. Preventing depression, giving you a hope giving you trust in the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, giving you validation that you deserve to exist. A lot of people, oh, do I deserve to exist? Am I good enough? You are, that's why Allah created you. 
That's why he chose you to be existent in such and such day. Gives you humility and it gives you hope for a better future. For you. There's a lot of different, you know, impacts and implications of understanding the name and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, such as the Hakim al-Rahim al-Qadir. So from the hikmah, anything that happens to you has a hikmah behind it. So you and I may say, oh, why did this thing happen to me? But it happened by the choice and ability of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if I was in charge, I would have prevented it, but Allah chose not to prevent it and made it happen. So Allah's choice for me is better and much better than my own choice for myself. Right? As a statement I believe from Ibn Qayyum goes, is that were we to realize what would happen if the things that did not happen were to happen, we'd be like super thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we were to able to see that you wanted something, Allah did not make that happen. But if you were to see what would that thing lead to and the consequences of that thing, you'd realize that how much of a favor it was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for him to prevent what you wanted. For him to not give you that driving seat. For him to do something even against your will. And obviously you have a hope for better. You're not thinking that my life is going downhill. It's a very important point because you can ask someone who does not believe in Islam that why let someone who has reached an old age or is suffering from Alzheimer, why, why let that person live? Why let that person suffer and the family suffer? Right? From that 2 and 2 equals 4 perspective, from a non-metaphysical world's perspective, it wouldn't make sense because there's no hope for something to get better. So now, another thing, you can do an analysis. Obviously, once you know Quran is true, then you know Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is the messenger of Allah. But if you want to do another psychological analysis, then you can think, look, there are a few different options, right? A'udhu Billah, one option is that he was lying. If he was lying, what was the motive behind it? And you don't see him chasing the worldly pleasure, right? So if you go back to history, you can cut that option out. Was he deluded? If somebody, A'udhu Billah, was deluded, how can he come with such a comprehensive sharia, which is consistent, and it has like huge impact. So the option that leaves you with is that he was truthful. So that's basically what we have done. You know, the evidence is for the existence of God, oneness of God, who is God, revelation, Quran being a revelation of God, and Prophet Muhammad being the messenger of God. So after that, you want to invite them to take the shahada because you want to save them from the eternal burning in hellfire. So you give them this notion, look, this is the concept of salvation in Islam. Now again, just like we said earlier about the concept of God, you compare this concept of salvation to any other religion out there. And then you'll see what happens, right? So salvation is dependent on the mercy of Allah. From that mercy is His, his, his facilitation for us to do good, for Him to give 10 times the reward for one good deed and one sin for one bad deed. From the salvation, is when we are in trouble, when we go through pain, when we go through suffering in this life, we are cleansed of sins. And the opportunities like fasting one day and being cleansed, you know, praying five times a day and being washed off of our sins, so on and so forth. So that's all from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so that's our concept of salvation. You can compare that with any other. And now the point comes that how do you recognize that this is from truth or not? So, so in terms of, first point is that it's a gift, right? It resonating in your heart is a gift. Faith is like gift, just like sanity is a gift. There are many people who have different mental illnesses and they don't see the world as you and I see. Even if they are super smart, even if they're super smart. See what this guy says, super smart guy, right? But he thinks that there's a possibility that we are in a simulation being played by aliens who are in another simulation. So you can say all sorts of weird ideas, right? But when you have that sort of, you know, gift of faith, you recognize the truth. So another thing that's very important is that you don't have to limit yourself to the tools that they have, okay? So somebody at a ground level can see this thing. This is a ground vision, okay? So if you are seeing a ground vision and you're saying, okay, I'm only gonna use my ground vision, you're your vision would be limited. But if you have the ability to rise up and see the world from a perspective of wahi, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should see it. And what would happen is you will, you're showing them that look, this wahi is consistent with your ground view 
and it makes sense with the reality. So now you have much more knowledge and that knowledge came not only from your own earthly tools, but using the tools of Wahi. So let's move on. So I, usually I use this example. Okay, so I say, look, this is my phone right here. So if you put your finger there, like if I put my wrong finger, it does not unlock, right? But if I put my right, correct finger, it actually unlocks. It did. So the point is just like the phone has this fingerprint scanner, understanding of the truth. Likewise, Allah has given us a fitra, a nature, innate nature, operating system, firmware, whatever you want to call it. And that is what's mentioned in Surah Nur. Nurun ala nur, right? So you have this notion, and when Wahi comes, it becomes light upon light. So when you give this example, this understanding, this worldview that we shared with you, the story of Adam alayhi salam, who Allah is, you know, the salvation, it makes sense in my heart. That's why I'm a Muslim. It, it makes sense. That's a gift of faith. Okay? And then you tell them, look, so you also have this heart. Sometime it may be rusted. So this discussion this new light coming to you, this new worldview coming to you, may cleanse it for you. And if you have some objections, some concerns, some hesitations, we can cover them as we will, inshallah, we'll do a very quick run through of them. That can erase that and then give you that cleanliness of the heart to recognize the truth. So if I were to summarize, look at the Islamic concept of God, who God is. Look at the Islamic concept of the Messenger of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his seerah, what, what his enemies said about him, and his prophecies, his life events. Then look at the book Quran. That's the only preserved religious text, by the way. There's no other religion that claims that you have the ability to go back to the originals. There's no religion that claims that you have the ability to go back to the originals from God. They may say, oh, it's from such and such person, you know, interpretation or whatever, but you don't have the ability to go back to the originals. So all of that actually makes it super sound. It makes sense to a sound heart. And if it doesn't, the best thing you can do is to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to clean your heart and to give you the gift of guidance. Then you remind them of the importance of verbalizing this faith, if this makes sense to them, the pillars of Islam. And you invite them to take the first step, which is verbalizing their faith. Now here are some co common challenges, okay? So we're gonna be running through them very quickly, but as I said, you have it all in your slide deck. All you need to do is start, initiate some conversations, take it to wherever you can take it, you know, then arrange a meeting with us, or you know, email us, call us, you know, see us, and then we'll give you further information, and then inshallah, together we can at least, just think about it, just give a clear, confident, intelligent message of Islam. That's it, just, just keep giving it away. There are many people who are ready for it, and they either they will accept it today, or if not, it will clean them, clean them and in a few years, a year, months, they will accept it. So, somebody say, well, I only believe in science. That is absolutely false. They think they only believe in science, but that's not true. I'll show you. Look, science is not the only way to discover truth. You and I, them, non-believers, people already believe in facts and they adhere to it, even though it has no scientific backing. So, example of that would be, for example, you know, if someone like that asks you for a meal, do you think you have a moral obligation to help that child? Ask that question to that person. If he says yes, that's not scientific. If he says no, that's not scientific either. Okay? The Genji's can't exist. Right? You don't know his existence based on scientific facts. Okay, you know it from history, from narrations, from testimony. Okay? You, do you know that you have a great, 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 great grandfather? Everybody believes so, but that's not a scientific validation. You don't have any scientific proof for that person's existence. Okay? Now, even this thing, the concept of logic, right? So this is logically fine. But then how do you prove that this logic is correct? Right? So you can have this recursive argument that how do you prove that this rational deduction is fine. That's not a scientific thing either. There's tons of things, okay? Uh, the taste, you may desire a certain cake. How do you prove that scientifically? You choose to marry someone or to be with someone without any involvement of science. You don't do a scientific compatibility test that you know, based on scientific uh, simulation, this person is gonna be a perfect wife for me or perfect husband for me. You don't do that. Moreover, 
you don't, um, you know that who your mother is, right? Nobody has a, you, you, there's a, there's a lady that you serve, you love, you stay with, you take care of her and you believe she's your mother and there's no scientific backing for that. You haven't done any scientific tests for that. So you can use these examples to say, look, I appreciate what you're saying, but that's not true. You know things to be true that has no scientific basis. So there's more ways of knowing the truth that are beyond science. And if you were to limit yourself to only science, your function, functionality would be very limited. Also, now we can go into these details in advanced courses. Any scientific theory is based on these three things. Number one, it is based on probability that this is the most likely you know, uh, explanation. It's based on assumptions. There's a lot of things that you need to assume to build a theory on top of it. And then finally there are disputes. Even within the scientific community, if there's a theory, there may be opposing views. Okay, so quickly example like, you know, so evolution, the theory of evolution or Darwinian, uh, Darwinism, uh, Darwinian evolution does not prove that human beings came from monkey. That's a possible theory, they can say it, right? It's like, for example, if you have a full novel, right? And I give you, you know, randomly, I give you 100 pages from this 1,000 uh, page book, right? You can write the rest of the pieces as long, however you, you like. And then somebody else can write it in however way they like, right? That doesn't mean that there's only one absolute truth. And which is fine. This is how scientific progress happens. People have theories, dependency, you build on that and you keep going. But the point is, but it does not contradict Islam. So you can keep going into that as long as you want. But the very important point is that science does not have, the philosophy of science does not use any external thing as a cause. So the discussion of God created or not created is not a scientific discussion because that's outside. You cannot have that. So you have this limited vision, you cannot see beyond that. Right? So if I were to only see in this space, I'm going to be only talking about this space. Anything outside of this room, I cannot talk about. So that's why science is not going to be touching God. So yeah, somebody says, you know, I believe seeing is believing. So I already gave you tons of examples. That's not true. People believe in things such as the existence of their great, 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 great grandmother, even without seeing them. And you don't believe in things, even if you see a magic trick, you know it's, it's a trick. Right? Even if you saw that proof of 1 equals 2, you don't believe in it even though you saw it because it just doesn't make sense. Now, another notion somebody can ask you, what's the wisdom behind you know, pork and this and that? So you say, look, I'm worshipping Allah. I'm worshipping the who. I'm not worshipping the why. Right? I'm not doing something only because it intellectually makes sense. And as we already show an example, you can manipulate intellect. You can make something appear to be intellectually true or convincing even though it isn't. Right? There are many examples of that, how politi politicians do that, and how we saw that in a math example. You're doing it because you know it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes you may get partial wisdom, and as more scientific research is done, more case studies is done, your iman grow. Right? You see like the consequences of the haram thing. And sometimes you also have to understand the context of the society. Certain things may be permissible because Islam is general. Islam is not only for Toronto. So you may have some rule or some permission and you might say, oh, why do I need that, right? So exa simple example of you can clean yourself without water, right, with stones. Now, somebody would say, oh, why do I need that? It's because you have to understand that Islam is so general that it has to be applicable and applicable in all places in the world. Okay, for, for Christians, you know, especially help them understand that, look, by upgrading, they're not disobeying Jesus, peace be upon him. They're upgrading just like people who are following Moses were to upgrade to Jesus when Jesus came, peace be upon them. Likewise, when Prophet Muhammad came, they are upgrading and in this upgrade, they're actually being obedient to all the previous messengers as well. And then the notion of reverting, you're not really giving up something, you're going back to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you and the double rewards that exist for the people of the book. Right, as Quran says, Yu'tikum kiflaini mi rahmati. So they have double rewards for following the previous prophet and the next prophet. So this is also very encouraging. Some people say, oh, I just love God and I want to be a good person. Well, if you love God, it necessitates for you to know what God loves and to love what God loves and to hate what God hates. Otherwise, you're not being consistent. And what is good if you don't know what God loves and you don't avoid what God, God hates? So you have some people who say, well, I just want to do it like, you know, when I'm perfect, when I can do everything, that's not true. That doesn't happen. That's a, you know, this, this, that's a deception from shaitan. You know, we saw in the example of a story of Adam alayhi salam, so on and so forth. 
tell you. So another quick thing is basically something known as self-evident truths. And you can look it up, right? So for example, if Elon Musk come and say, hey, you know what? I believe that we are in a simu simulation. This is not reality, we are in a simulation. Who has to prove? And he tells me, Zubair, you prove that we are not in a simulation. Who has to prove? Me or him? So there's a notion of self-evident truths in logic that somebody who is coming against the self-evident truth has to bring the proof. And you have this in Islam too, right? So for example, if our brother says that, hey, this, this phone belongs to him, and we go to an Islamic court, who has to prove it? Me or him? You have to prove it, right? Because I already have it. So you are the one who is making the claim, you have to prove it. So likewise, there's a concept in self-evident truth, and there, there are values and rules and axioms around it. So from that angle, logically speaking, the person who says there is no God, he has to prove it. Because God's existence is a self-evident, known over time, non-across cultural, simplest explanation, uh, known to mankind. So I'm gonna skip. Okay, this is very important. It's gonna be on your slide deck. If somebody comes and says, hey, you know what? I think, I get it, not all Muslims are terrorists. I understand that. But I think that all terrorists are Muslims. Or he may make a simpler claim and say, all terrorists are religious people. Okay, and if you have the data on your phone, you can show them that, that look, that's not true. This is what Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us from facts. And then look at this. Atheists, Christians, and number of people they killed, Right? So it's not true that Islam leads to terror, that all terrorism terrorists are Muslim, and it's not true that all terrorists are religious people. You have data to show that, and you know, uh, basically take care of that myth. So, yeah, so you, basically these things, and somebody says, you know, I know I need more time. So here's a quick example for that. Look, and this is for us too, right? When we say, oh, I'm gonna do Tawbah next, I'm gonna do Tawbah tomorrow, I'm gonna live up this sin in a few years. Look, there's a very important uh, analogy here. Look, think of a man, who is willing to, who is trying to cut a tree. Okay, that's an obstacle for him. But he says, I'm gonna do it tomorrow. I'm gonna do it tomorrow. The longer he takes, the, the, the longer he takes to do that, the weaker the back of the man gets, gets, and the stronger the tree gets. So the more you delay, you have a chance of losing the gift of faith, and harder it is for you to take, uh, follow the truth. So you explain it to them, and then finally, it's very important when somebody takes shahada, you, you help them to successfully adopt it. We talked about it in today's khutbah different roles that you can play to helping someone being a customer success champion. So now what remains is, for example, their further resources. What remains is um, their live dialogue on the YouTube channel under different playlists that you can uh, vis visit, practice, train yourself. So what remains now is basically for you to practice and then see what you can do and how many people can you convey the message. And if there are people who are super crazy or super opposing, just leave them alone. And there's a lot of people who are open to truth. They are sincerely looking for truth. Uh, reach out to them. Okay? So inshallah, I'll conclude here. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa tubulik. Assalamu alaikum.